Hey, how's it going, guys? This is Tom from UDS with another edition of UDS Interviews, our series where we chat to interesting people from around the world. Now, my guest this week is one of the true pioneers of modern British rock music, with a back catalogue of work that has influenced many and is the envy of others. Here to talk all about their brand new album with a brand new project, it is my pleasure to introduce lecturer, singer, songwriter, and overall handsome man, Van <laughs> Duran. Hey mate, how you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. How are you doing today? Uh, feeling pretty well flattered by that intro, so thanks for that. Cheers. <laughs> I speak no lie, I speak no lie. <laughs> now as we, as we you know, chat today, it's, it's kind of mid-September, which is where I would say Halloween starts for me. I'm a big fan of Halloween and, and everything that goes with it. And if I remember correctly from a previous interview you've done, you are a fan of horror movies yourself. Um, I, I do. I haven't watched too many of the sort of modern ones. I like the, the classic stuff. Um, if I'm honest, just to touch upon Halloween being in mid-September, I'm quite disappointed that I haven't seen the sweets out yet properly. I know, I know. I'm it's, sure it's, what's going on there, but you know. Uh, in in one of my bougier moments, I did go into M and S the other day, and they are doing a uh, a Halloween variety of Percy Pigs already, which I was very impressed by. So I had to nab a bag of them. But I was going to ask you, uh, classic, modern, anything uh, you know that you would consider horror. What movies would you recommend out, straight out of the gate that people watch for Halloween? Um, just the original Dawn of the Dead has always been an absolute classic for me. Um, the Exorcist is always good. Um, I think recently, actually, I watched the um, the Fear Street trilogy on Netflix. Oh yeah, which is well worth a watch. I found it's just fun. It kind of had the kind of vibe of the old Scream movies, but mm. really violent. Um, so yeah, those kinds of things. Really, I used to like sort of the zombie films and stuff back in the day. The George Romero stuff. I like the Zack Snyder remake as well. Dawn of the Dead. I thought that was pretty decent. Yeah, um, he's probably my favourite film of his, to be honest. I, I think he, he he started strong with that. Uh, you mentioned George Romero, though. I was very lucky about five or six years ago that he was at a Comic-Con in London and I got to have a photo with him. And being, you know, a, t- a stupid teenager, I was like, I'm going to try and get George A. Romero to see whether or not he'll... Uh, be happy to fist bump you know just like a, a something like that and uh he's about you know six foot nine or was unfortunately he's, he's a, a one, massive yeah. massive man and yeah. so i'm just like this meek skinny little teenager i'm like excuse me mr romero do you mind if we <laughs> fist bump in our photo and he goes excuse me son and like i had to like ex- explain it and he, and he was like super on board for it he was like oh sure dude would we'll do that and he's like this yeah. old hippie guy and oh no he was the best he was the best no so. you're lucky man you're lucky man to meet him yeah he's a wonderful yeah He's a cool dude. He's a cool dude. And, uh, you know, I'm speaking to a cool dude right now. And the one way I like to get to know uh, my new friends a little bit better is asking the hard hitting questions. And so uh, (laughs) before we get into the music, I have to ask, Colin, if you were a type of sandwich, what kind of sandwich would you say best represents you as a person? (sighs) I'm going to go. There's actually an amazing sandwich place quite near me, actually. Um, And I'm going to go with the, uh, the peri peri chicken with salad. Because I like the salad. That's so, it. A bit spicy, but you know, but good for you too. That's it. That's it. As a good, <laughs> that's a good sandwich to eat. It's a good kind of person to be as well. Um, <laughs> if, I tell you what, I interviewed um, Jamie Lenman last year, and he had the easiest answer. He just went a Reuben, and I was like, oh, Ooh. you had to, you had to, didn't you? Well, why not? Do you know what I mean? If the pun's there, you know, exactly, take it, take exactly. It. Um, but anyway, we are here, to, unfortunately, not to talk about sandwiches, but to talk about your new project, They Fell from the Sky, and uh, your upcoming album, Decade, uh, will be the first as part of the project. But the project does go back um, over a decade, if I've if I've read correctly. So it's, could, could yeah. you just tell us a little bit about how it all came came about? Yeah, so it was just, um, I think Jason just had some ideas. And, you know, I did stuff with him with This Is Menace. Um, I did one of my first ever shows, like even before we were 100 Reasons, did that with Pitch Shifter, my, my local venue, which is the Camberley Agincourt people. <laughs> um and that was cool. And so I kind of met Jason there. And it wasn't like we suddenly like, we're best friends now. I was just <laughs> lo- I was just a local support. But we kind of crossed paths again. We had, um, we had a sound engineer called Steve Gurney, um, also known as Steve from Cov. Um, and he became our sound engineer as well. So when the This Is Menace thing came about, 
um, you know, managed to sort of put us in touch. Um, and it was just easy. Jason's really easy to work with. I like to think I'm quite easy to work with because I think that's how you make great music with like not having tons of tension unless it's just good for the song. Mm. So, you know, he's imaginative. I like to think I'm imaginative too. So he kind of had some ideas and he sort of threw them my way. I said, well, I've got some ideas to go over that. And it kind of just went from there really. And then we got Dave Draper involved as well on the production side of things, helping to write. Um, and it, it, I suppose, you know, the album's actually been finished probably about two years. Wow. Like for a long time, we've kind of sat on it. Um, and it was kind of figuring out what we were going to do with it. So when we call it Decade, it was probably about 10 years after we started. So even though it's a bit over a decade now, it was kind of apt. And it's also like 10 songs on the album as well. Um, so it's it's got that kind of whole theme to it, which is quite nice. I like things like that. So, um, yeah, and then it just kind of progressed and... I think the songs have probably been re-recorded a couple of times as well, just as production techniques have changed and sounds have changed. And, you know, Jason's like super metal. Um, I'm not. And I don't mean that in a di- in difficult way because I love quite a lot of metal. But what I don't like is the albums I make to sound metal. So mm. we had a few sort of discussions about where that was going to be. And, and what I found a lot with metal records production wise is they they're kind of a lot of the times in production of the time, you know, and that's, again, that's fine. You know, if that's your bag, I certainly don't have issue with that. But, um, but for me, I like something to sound a little bit more sort of rounded and less like now rather than I just want it to sound big. So um, Dave Draper was great. He was on board with that. So, and you go back and you'd have ideas because you were sitting on us for such a long time. You could go, well, you know, I'm quite not quite happy with that melody there, or maybe I'm going to change those lyrics a little bit. And, you could kind of go in and, and redo stuff because you just could. Um, so, yeah, it took a long time to sort of come about. There's quite a few songs that are on the cutting room floor um, just because, you know, we didn't feel as though the vibe was quite right about them or they just kind of weren't doing it um, for whatever reason. And no, I'm not really into the idea of sort of going back to ideas that you'd kind of know mm. on, you know, up, up to par or not you know, good enough to make a record or something. So there's plenty of that too. Um, but yeah, it took a long time, but yeah, I'm glad it's, it's, it's here. Finally, it's here. finally, finally. And, uh, and, and obviously when you make something where you, uh, you know, the only sort of time constraints are, are, you, are put on by yourself, I find sometimes, you know, even if I'm not doing something musically, um, you struggle to find out where that, that sort of finish moment is. You sort of, you can tinker and tweak for until, you know, until the cows come home. But how, how easy was it to find that moment where you were, you know, like these songs are done or this song is done or this segment is done? Uh, was it quite, uh, you know, a general consensus or, or was it quite difficult to sort of, you know, you know, draw a line under certain elements of the album? I mean, I find it very easy to draw a line under things because I'm a firm believer that nothing will ever be perfect. But the point is, is are you really happy with it? Mm. And if nothing is irritating me, rather than going, it's all absolutely amazing. If it's not irritating me, then that's good enough for me. And if I don't, you know, when I listen back to, you know, the stuff that's played or the melodies that I've written and things like that, as long as I'm not sitting there thinking, oh, I wish that was different, you know, then that's okay. And if I sit, so I'm, I'm quite easy to please um, because... You know, I, I think I have a good barometer for what I feel is is good music. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm very good at trusting that. And like I said, some things aren't worth like a big reshuffle or just to tweak something a little bit or whatever. You know, some people can get so into it and I respect that. That's absolutely fine if that works for them. I'm not here to kind of judge anybody in the way they work. Um, but just in the way that I work, I'm, I'm really easy going. And I think Jason's kind of quite the same. And rather than a lot of people might come out of the studio and go, man, that was amazing. That was the best thing I've ever done. I'll finish a vocal tone and just go, yeah, happy with that. <laughs> and then Dave will probably go, yeah, that's cool, mate. Or he'll go, well, why don't you try this or something? And then we'll give that a go. And, and you know, it's, it's easy. And that's kind of the, you know, when I'm trying to work with people, that's what I like it to be easy. Absolutely. If you're not enjoying it, then uh, then there's no point, no point in doing it. But you, you say this album has been, you know, a long time coming. Uh, it even got got pushed back ever so slightly from its original release date, wasn't it? It was originally meant to come out, sort of, was it late summer? And now it's Octo- yeah. October 3rd, I think, is the, the release date now. Um, See, so before you said, you mentioned that, you know, this this album has sort of been done and dusted for two uh, two years. I, I assume that, you know, with this whole sort of, you know, 
uh, meticulousness around it all and everything that there was this little bit of fine tuning that you needed to do but was there any particular reason that we're, we're now looking at the October release? It was just vinyl production ah. so there's been a lot of issues in, in terms of vinyl production you ask any band that's trying to do vinyl at the moment it's not easy so you know we haven't tweaked it you know Dave finished mastering it I think it must have been about nearly two years ago around then and it was just you know sitting around wondering what to do then we had sort of the pandemic come in so again you're like well it's not really i know a lot of people are releasing new music during that particular period of time but you know it wasn't really the right time for us necessarily mm. um so yeah it was yeah <laughs> that's kind of how it ended up more than anything one of those things but uh but i i am certain that you know uh an extra couple of months i mean i've been lucky enough to listen to the record and it is oh, cool. very much worth the wait it's very much worth the wait thank you thank um, you and uh, one of the things that, you know, you, you were mentioning in, in previous interviews and in the press leading up to the album is that uh, They Fell From The Sky would be a studio project. And then you tease us with a release show. You tease us with a release show on uh, December 9th, I believe. Um, yeah. So, uh, so what, when did you first sort of, you know, uh, decide or, or what was the thought process behind actually we do want to take They Fell From The Sky on the road at least once? Well, we can play it live. So, you know, if you listen to the record, it's just a, it's a rock record. There's no kind of weird, don't need like string quartets or anything <laughs> like that to set up or anything. And I think it just felt that, you know, I think as the conversations had, we felt it'd be more of a shame if we didn't. So it's just something that you kind of get to do and go and have a bit of fun. And we've never said we'd be completely a studio band. If, the, you know, if something felt right to do, mm. then we'd do it. Um, so we had quite a few sort of discussions internally about, you know, how that's going to happen. And it was just, we could sort of tie it in just before Christmas or something. And, you know, the, the album's still, you know, hopefully in people's minds and that kind of thing. So, and it'll give them a chance to listen to it, get to know the songs and then you just go and play a show. And, you know, the whole point of sort of never saying never is because, you know, it come back, comes back to bite you if you do. Um, this is true. But when I was doing those sort of previous interviews, there were genuinely no plans mm. to to play a show. And but just the thing that's really quite funny is that the more people ask you, the more people you think, well, hmm, maybe I will. <laughs> um, so it's it's kind of almost like a I don't know a self fulfilling prophecy of sorts, <laughs> you know. Um, so that's that's probably the real reason why I came about. People go, why don't you play a show? And you go, hmm, why don't we play a show? So. Yeah, uh, the more people ask, the more, you know, the more kind of goes into your, your psyche. Well, I'm, I'm glad the groundswell of uh, peer pressure, shall we say, uh, did, did its job because I, yeah, I, much... I don't normally do peer pressure. I'm not a peer <laughs> pressure person, in fairness. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm just happy that I'm going to be able to scream my lungs out to dry at least once. So that's going to that's going to be fun. That's going to yeah. be fun. Um, and I suppose the answer, you know, the, the question that everyone will be asking after this is, is this a one off or is, you know, is there a possibility of more in future? I don't know, because I think the whole I think what's what's served us quite well is not having huge expectations from the project. And I think maybe when we started out, you know, we're all a lot younger and you kind of sit and go, oh, well, maybe, you know, this could be a thing or whatever. But when you sort of get to our age these days you know you kind of just play it by ear and go well does that sound like a good idea yeah right let's do it then or you know rather than sort of trying to commit to do something um it's just got to be something that people want to be a part of rather than something that is sort of you know at the end of the day when you're in a full-time band it's great fun but it is a job and that's what your job is that's what sort of pays the bills so to speak but when you're kind of doing things for just enjoying music and having a really good time with people that you love um you know, it just becomes more chilled out, more relaxed. So it's never about sort of pushing something or pushing an agenda or trying to work your way up the charts or, the, you know, whatever it is that your goal might be as an artist. But for us, it's just, well, we all get on really, really well. Do you fancy going and doing something? Yeah, right. And if someone else chucks something our way and says, do you fancy doing that? We'll have a chat about that. So it's it's got to be that casual because, you mm-hmm. know, that's just, just where we're at with the project. It's not, you know, let's go to America for six months and try and break it, you know, it's, no. Just go and do a show if someone wants to come and people want to come and see you play. You know, if the appetite seems to be there, then yeah, lots of different things. But generally, yeah. 
Easy. Absolutely. Whenever, whenever you know, you're not relying on something either, you know, financially or or at the behest of others, is always more fun. So, so yeah, it's it's definitely I can see the appeal of keeping it casual. Um, and you know, after uh, you know, after eighteen months or so of of no one being able to see a show, uh, it must be fun from sort of both sides to you know to finally you know get in that live experience again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I haven't done any shows I think since. 2018 and I did some acoustic shows and stuff with the Andy from HR but mm. other than that you know I mean my voice feels great you know I don't have an issue with that so why not exactly you know? exactly well I'm looking forward to that but just looking back previously into into history a bit um over the past 18 months when we haven't been able to go out and do the things we like uh I don't know about you but I've been consuming a hell of a lot more media whether it be movies video games tv shows all that sort of stuff and we talk about all that kind of crap on, I know uh, on, yeah on so YouTube. yeah oh, you checked us out I appreciate well, yeah, it I you know, you've got to know who you're talking to, oh, you know. Oh, I'm, I am truly honoured. I am truly honoured. But I have to I have to ask you, um, if you could have one of your songs from They Fell From The Sky featured in anything, whether it be a movie, a video game, nothing's off the table, what would be your dream thing? Elden Ring. It wouldn't suit the game at all. Or maybe it would. Maybe there's something that could work. Maybe there would be a way to do it. It wouldn't work. Elden Ring. I mean, I'm so excited. I'm so excited for it. So I could... I could, I could see it. I could see it. Why not? I love, I love Hidetaki Miyazaki. I love him. I think his what he's bringing to games these days is just amazing. And I bought Demon Souls back in the day. Loved it. Done all the Souls games, Bloodborne, Sekiro, all of it. So Elden Ring, I've been waiting for for a very, very long time. And it's nice that George R. R. Martin might be is involved in terms of world building and stuff like that. But now nah, I just want to sit there in January with my headphones on and get my family to not bother me for the whole weekend. <laughs> that, that's it. I mean, Which won't happen, but um, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the dream. A man can dream. A man can dream. A man can dream, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Those games, I mean, I mean, full disclosure, I am not talented enough to to even, you know, finish one of those games, let alone all of them. But they, it is, the, you know, they, they are in effect sort of modern arcade games because you do sort of get the, uh, you know... Um, the, the the mechanics and sort of the rhythm of it all and everything like that mm. plays such an important part that yeah I mean obviously with Elden Ring there's the story and everything I'm not the biggest George R R Martin fan like I, I I quite like Game of Thrones but I'm not an addict or anything like nah. that but the the world building is nice but it's those it's it's the gameplay that quite rightly yeah. takes center stage which I'm um, I'm really excited about yeah me too um, I mean I have completed them all. <laughs> um, apart from Sekiro actually I just can't seem to do the last boss on that but I will um, but I just think that the world building that Hideteki does is mm. incredible um, and I know George R. Martin kind of did the backstory stuff I think that so he kind of just laid set the scene so the story is still going to be from soft and I just think the way they tell stories and it's just a, they're just games that don't hold your hand mm. and and I like that idea I like that sort of you know, there's a lot of interviews, but there's not loads of interviews with him, but he goes back to these kind of Steve Jackson, Ian Livingston books, which are kind of choose your own adventure stuff. I love them. And it's kind of what you call like, whenever I sort of play one of their games, there's a genuine joy of discovery. And, that, you know, I will slate games like Skyrim and stuff like that because they are fun to play. But when you kind of find like a cave or something, you don't sort of think, oh, I wonder what I'm going to find down here. It's boring. Mm. Whereas with something like a Dark Souls game, when you find a nook or a Bloodborne, you know, you find a nook, you think, wow, what could be down in? It's usually something absolutely terrifying. But it's absolutely, but to have that as like a, a huge open world, you know, and have that mentality, that's what I think is amazing. And that's what I think it offers that other, other games don't. But I'm excited what, what, for it. 100%. They are, they, they are works of art. And I tell you what, not because I, I, was one of the the fools that got an xbox series x over a ps5 and seeing all the gameplay of demon souls remastered just made me think have i have i made the wrong choice have i made the wrong choice but... i don't think anybody can make the wrong choice you just got to do what's right for you mm. um i i have both so <laughs> that's the right <laughs> that's, choice that for me. is the right choice yeah that is the, the right. right choice is both because each concert you know i can talk about games all day you must mm. know that by the way but i love video games me too so the thing for me is that, um there's no right or wrong decision. I just buy platforms that have games on it that are fun to play. I think Game Absolutely. Pass on Xbox is awesome. Um, you know, I don't buy very many games on Xbox. I buy most games on PS5. Um, yeah, Demon's Souls is amazing. 
it, it's just a beautiful game. And I think where where Sony really does it for me is if, and this is just fanboy stuff aside, but when you play a PlayStation 5 game, the loading times are offensively fast. Like mm. you're literally talking one or two seconds to go from a menu into the game. And that in itself takes me back to, you know, I had a Japanese import Sega Mega Drive back in the day. That's how old I am. But to have that kind of convenience back, you know, is, is incredible. And I think once third parties really get to grips with it, it will really bring some, not just innovation, because, and you know, everyone sort of talks about innovation all the time, but sometimes just quality of life is better. If you're playing 100%. Red Dead and you spend two minutes on an old console and a loading screen, it's like, oh, you know, but when you're, you know, when you're in it a lot quicker, it's it's a lot more appealing to put something on and actually play it. It's such so, a lower yeah. barrier to entry. I mean, I I'm I'm the same. I uh, I recently modded my old Game Boy Advance SP to have an HD nice. screen and uh, uh, got one of those um, those cartridges you can whack a uh, an SD card in and just fill it yeah. fill it with emulators. And I've been playing all the old um, RPGs that back in the day I was either too too young or too too impatient to play through. And and you are right. It's, even on an emulator, it's so fast. It's so snappy with those cartridge load times that yeah. when you go back to uh, you know, particularly previous generation disc based games, you do you do yeah. really notice it. So so yeah, I, I completely agree. Have you seen the um, analog pocket? I have. Is that the one with the uh, the crank? It's the Game Boy. Uh, do you know analog do you know what analog is? That games company they do like um you can buy like a so you get the Super NT, which is a Super Nintendo, and it uses um FPGA. You're looking it up now, aren't you? I am, FPGA. yeah. <laughs> Um, the consoles, you get like the Mega SG, which is Sega Mega Drive. So it runs the games, actual Sega Mega Drive games or Super Nintendo games. But they've got one. Well, it's just been delayed, actually. But it's the um, it's basically a, a Game Boy that they've made. Ah, cool. Yeah, no, th- this is something different to what I was, I was expecting. But yeah. that looks, that is a work of art. That is a gorgeous, gorgeous machine. Yeah. Oh, I may. I, I'm a sucker for. <laughs> I'm trying to collect all the retro consoles, and so I, uh, I, I love all all that sort of stuff. But yeah, the Game Boy was my first attempt at any, uh, modding anything beyond like yeah. a, a Raspberry Pi or anything like that. So uh, oh, I've got a yeah. Raspberry Pi. I've got a Pi Four. But uh, I actually, yeah. I'm still rocking the Pi 3, but uh, it's, it still does the job for anything sort of up to PS2. N64 is a bit wafty, but uh, PS1, yeah, sorry, PS1's fine. Yeah, no, it's better on Pi 4, but I mean, I've actually, got, I'm probably going to get rid of it soon anyway, because I've got like an old style, not old, old gaming laptop, but it's a gaming laptop. So I've built that. Do you have Launchbox? Do you know what Launchbox is? No, I've not heard of that. So, it's a, so do you know what RetroArch is? I, the name rings a bell. The name rings a bell. So RetroArch is effectively a a front end if you will so you download cores which are the emulators and it all mm. runs out of one program so oh, rather okay. than switch with emulators and then launchbox is like a front end so you can import games into launchbox from your folders or whatever they are but it also downloads all of the artwork and everything as well oh, and then you have this thing called big box which is a paid version of launchbox where it just becomes full screen on your computer and uh, you know my computer's powerful enough to do like GameCube, Dreamcast, PS2. Yeah. Not really interested too far past that anyway. But um, you should look up Launchbox. If you've got a PC that can do. do a bit of emulation, you should do that. And then pay the money for Big Box because you should give these people money because they, they work really hard. Mm, and then you absolutely. can go to a place called, um, maybe I shouldn't be sharing this online too much. I won't say where I get the stuff from, but there's name a great redacted. website. Yeah, name redacted. And maybe I'll put it in the chat for you. <laughs> um, but it's where you go to get, um, if you've gone to buy, not buy, if you've gone to download images for your Raspberry Pi, mm. you might have found that particular website already. I, th- I think I think I know what you mean. I'm, again, I'm yeah. not going to say just in case no. the feds the feds are listening. But uh, <laughs> know, uh, right? but, but yeah, no, that's the. Uh, I'm I'm definitely going to check that out because because yeah, I, I I I, yeah. I play. I've been playing my Game Boy more than my Switch lately, which uh, uh, yeah probably means I need to get back on the, some of the other retro hype. But uh, but anyway, we we've been talking. <laughs> we've talked about sandwiches. We talked about horror films. We've talked about video games. We should probably talk, have at least one more question about music, and Definitely. that is I uh, I couldn't you know chat to you without bringing up uh, hundred reasons at least once uh you know they're, they're one of the bands that shaped uh, my uh, my formative music taste and uh you, you know you're coming back on tour next year after yes. uh, after a little while um so this is something again you've teased in interviews earlier but how does it feel you know to to not only sort of you know be be playing live but playing a tour across the country it's just nice to get out you know we all still get on we all talk those kinds of things so and again it's one of those things where if it feels like sort of the right thing to do then then we'll go and do it. Yeah. So 
yeah, it's just, it feels like a good time. You know, I think sort of over lockdown and stuff, you know, we were kind of planning on the tour before lockdown. Um, but we obviously didn't want to talk about it while all that stuff was happening. So it's been, again, it's been a pretty big secret. So I do apologise to everyone I've lied to <laughs> when I said nothing's going on because stuff absolutely has been. But yeah, I've just had to lie because that's what you have to do. Um, so it's just exciting. It's just cool. You know, Hellas for Heroes are in, which is amazing. So it's always been good fun with those guys. So it's just go out, have some fun, you know, see what happens, that kind of thing. 100%. I mean, I, I'm at the London show for sure. I bought the tickets the day they got, got announced. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to I, To my shame, I haven't been, had a chance to check out 100 Reasons Live yet. So this will be, uh, be a that's very right. cool experience You're for me. Been, we don't do much too often these days. So uh, <laughs> that's a perfectly valid excuse. <laughs> well, I won't be able to make an excuse uh, after after next year, which is very exciting. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it all times out. It's 20 years um, of uh, ideas as well, isn't it? Um, yeah, it was, but it's not, it's not an anniversary. It just happens to be in 2022. Yeah. Fort- fortuitous time timing for two well yeah time. we were looking at doing it in sort of early this year that's when it was originally going to be doing it so yeah we're not it's not a 20th anniversary thing it just happens that because of delays and everything else that it's now 2022 Fair so enough. fortuitous for some people maybe going, oh yeah you know but <laughs> that certainly wasn't the plan <laughs> well, that's good because, you know, some, sometimes, you know, because it, it seems to be the trend that a lot of bands do these, you know, full album playthroughs and they, they can be super cool. But particularly if it's a band like this, the 100 Reasons that perhaps don't tour that often, um, yeah. it is nice to have a mix of mix of everything. And I think when, uh, and, you know, a set list is dedicated to one album, you, you can sometimes uh, miss out on some of the uh, the other tracks. Yeah, so, so it'd be absolutely. good to have a, have a mixture of everything. I'm very much yeah. looking forward to it. It'll be that. <laughs> Excellent. Good to hear. Good to hear. Well, Colin, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you today. And I have one question left for you. And it's about as silly as a lot of the other questions I've asked you. So Alrighty. get ready. Uh, and that is We Are UDS. We stand for Upside Down Shark. Don't ask me why we settled with Upside Down Shark. It's a silly name we thought of many years ago when we were in way too deep to change it now. <laughs> but be that as it may, Colin, what is your favourite shark? And it could be real, it could be fictional, it could be a shark from a movie or a shark from real life. But what would you say your favourite shark is? I think we need to talk about sharks and how misrepresented they are. That's a good thing. Definitely. Um, because they're amazing creatures. We don't know enough about them. So I'm not super eco, by the way. I just think that, you know, if you're a human being, you happen to be in the ocean and you get bitten by a shark, it's generally not out of aggression or its wish to kill you. It's generally just going about its business. So exactly. that's always a, a bit of a thing. I think, um, do I have a favourite shark? I might go for a hammerhead shark, just because they're so strange looking. They um, certainly are. And I think the ocean's a wonderful thing anyway, in terms of all of the creatures that it has within it. But yeah, hammerhead sharks, you just kind of think, yeah, I have no idea what how you came about. Um, but yeah, there we go. My favourite shark is a hammerhead shark. It's easy to say great white, I know. But they do actually scare me when I look at them. Yeah, I mean, I, all, all sharks scare me, but I think it's a healthy fear that, you know, like... It's a healthy uh, it, respect. Exactly. It's like you, yeah. don't, you don't go up to a spider that, you know, is poisonous and then sort of tap it on the head or anything. Exactly. Heads, I think they do. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, you don't, you know, don't do that. But, you, you know, you're careful, you're mindful, that kind of thing. 100%. So, yeah. And, and the hammerhead, it, it's two for one. You've got a shark and a, you know, a DIY tool. What more, <laughs> what more could you want? What more exactly. Could you want? Exactly. And on, and on that ridiculous note, we will end it there. Colin, thank you again so much for your time. Now, pleasure. Cheers. Thank you.